here. Good grief, Humphrey. What is your hurry? Well, I got to talk to Pastor Matt before the service starts, and we got we to gotta hurry up. Good. All right, we're here. Good morning. Good morning. What are you here to tell me today? I'm here to tell you something really exciting. What is really exciting? Odyssey starts today. Odyssey starts today. That yes. means Sunday school? Yep, Sunday school starts today oh at 945. At no and I'm so excited because we're going to sing a song that's got a camel in it. <laughs> and he's really cool. The camel is cool? Yeah. Okay. Hey, you know something else? What? I am like an elephant. You're like an elephant? I never forget. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Do, do you ever forget? Sometimes I forget to finish church on time so that kids can get to Sunday school. I've heard that. <laughs> Word is out, yeah. <laughs> what have you not forgotten? I, I didn't forget that you sometimes do a second sermon and you don't let the people out on time. <laughs> So, if, if you have children and you need to leave at 9.35 because there's a second sermon going on, just leave. You have my permission. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> just leave like that. <laughs> uh, you never know what's going to happen on a Sunday morning. Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church, and uh, I guess welcome to fall. Last weekend being Labor Day, um, you know, several things have, uh, have started or picked up after Labor Day, not the least of which would include our Sunday school for our kids with Odyssey. And uh, I'm deeply uh, grateful to uh, Donna for all the work that both she and uh, her husband Randy have put in. I'm sure Randy's been painting and busy uh, preparing for uh, what we've got going for the kids this fall, too. Um, we're back to normal, hopefully, uh, and many of you know that last week um, I was uh, down still a little bit with COVID, uh, doing really well now, so thank you to all of you who have been uh, including us in your prayers, both my wife and I, we're feeling much, much improved, and um, this means also, you know, last week we changed a few things up, um, yet last week would have been a communion Sunday, but we withheld communion um, just because I didn't want there to be any issues with people being concerned about me handling food products. Um, and then this week is a non-communion Sunday, so um, we're kind of back to our normal schedule. We'll also include Sunday school for adult Bible class where we continue our study between services on um, the myth of righteous anger. So I look forward to uh, spending some time with you and hoping that you plan not only for your kids to be a part of Odyssey between services today, but also that you would take in some time to study God's Word and be with us today uh, in God's Word. I think we're going to dive in. We've got special things kind of throughout the day today, at the end of service today, I'm going to invite Dave Reinert, our congregation president, to come up. Dave, um, as many of you know, attended our national convention, the LCMS National Convention this summer, and um, they've got sort of a, a recap of the, um, of the convention that's been issued by Synod, and Dave is going to give a report at the end of service um, for this first service at the beginning of the second service. So we want to keep you appraised of what's going on within our Synod and the actions that are taken there, so I want to make sure we have some time both for that and to make sure that the kids can get out on time for Sunday school. So I think we're ready to get started this morning. We will begin with our opening hymn, number 902, we sing.
We'll be following Divine Service Setting 4. You'll find that on page 203 in the front of your hymnal if you choose to follow along in that way. We make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we're gathered this morning to hear God's word and to call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our service continues with the words of today's intro appointed. We speak these words responsively. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. To God on high be glory and peace to all the earth. Goodwill from God in heaven proclaimed at Jesus' birth. With praise and bless you, Father, your holy name we sing. Our thanks for your great glory, Lord God, our heavenly King. To you, O soul begotten, the Father's Son, we pray. O Lamb of God, our Savior, you take our sins away. On us, Jesus, receive our heartfelt cry. Where you in power are seated at God's right hand on high. You alone are holy. and adored you with the Holy Spirit alone our Lord most high in God the Father's glory Amen our glad reply the Lord be with you and also with you let us pray O God, from whom, come all, from whom all good proceeds, grant to us, your humble servants, your holy inspiration, that we may set our minds on the things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our reading.
Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 through 9. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to the, warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subjection, in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to the very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we join together and sing the Alleluia in verse. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. 
For the Son of Man came to save the lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And when he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, tell him to be to, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now have the opportunity to confess our common faith in the triune God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn number 826.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message is from this morning's epistle lesson from Romans chapter 13 as we continue our work through the book of Romans. In his book, the pastor and elder author Timothy Meck makes a point that I have shared with perhaps you as a congregation before. Certainly I have shared this with the group of elders as we've studied the book, that there is a big difference between power and authority. Power, author Meck makes the point, is the realm of Satan. In order to have power, You have to disempower someone else. You have to take the power by force. Whereas with authority, authority is a godly realm. God authorizes his people. He sends his people to do his work, and in turn his people operate within and under the realm of authority, and they submit to it willingly. These two systems couldn't be more different. Authority is good, power, bad. Authority is of God, power is of Satan. It's a brilliant observation that author Timothy Mack makes, and it's one that speaks to this text from today as well, from Romans 13. Because the truth is, people don't really like authority. I thought of this this morning. I'm like, how perfect is it? As I was driving in on 178 from west of town, there sat behind the sign at the heart doctor's office, a city police officer, slyly. Fortunately, I stopped at the four-way stop by the Methodist church, so I'm in good shape. See, people look for any way that they can to get out from under authority, and in so doing, they're looking for ways to get out from under the thumb of our God. Another case in point, I opened up my trusty Concordia commentary on the book of Romans and started reading on chapter 13 as I was preparing for today's sermon. And the very first sentence by author Mark Middendorf, or excuse me, um, Michael Middendorf, is one that he wrote with regard to today's reading. He says, quote, It is only a slight exaggeration to say that the history of interpretation of Romans chapter 13 is a history of attempts to avoid what seems to be the plain meaning of the text. What's the plain meaning of the text? Well, you tell me. I'll read just a portion of it. The summary statement, which is really the beginning of it. Let every person, that's bar none, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Why would somebody want to interpret these verses of Scripture in any other way? Why would someone want to ignore the plain sense of a text? Well, it's because they don't like what it has to say. It's because they don't like how it applies to them. And Paul tells us no one is exempt. All of us. Bar none are subject first to God and furthermore then to the authorities that exist because these authorities have been established and instituted by our God. Indeed, we don't like authority. And when we don't like authority, when we reject the authorities that God has put over us, it means that we want to be an authority unto ourselves. We become the authority. And in reality, that's a repeat of the very first sin dating back to Genesis 3. Our very first parents, Adam and Eve, rejecting the authority of God above them in their desire to eat the fruit that God had commanded them not to eat. They didn't want to be under the authority of God. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. And in so doing, they wanted to be like God. A God is the way the text reads. To wrest power from God and be the dictators of their own domain. So God leveled the curses against them. You can read about them in Genesis 3. It was their rejection of him as an authority and it became the cause for so many sins and sinful, a sinful world that surrounds us. And we still feel the effects of it today. Speaking of curses, 
I just dealt with something of a curse, having lived through a bout with COVID, as I mentioned, and as many of you were aware, and I know that it's affected several others around here as well. The first and most obvious thing that came to me as I was writing a sermon while living with COVID, I was writing this sermon while living with COVID, was the worldview towards the authorities of this world back at the beginning of the pandemic. Take a trip back in time with me about three years, where we went from listening initially to the authorities, people who were scientifically trained, people, authorities, scientists in the World Health Organization, or the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, or even the Chief Medical Advisor and the Surgeon General in the United States. People went from listening to their advice in the very beginning to rejecting their authority, especially when their authority to protect the public was seen more as a detriment to people's individual freedoms than as their role, which was as governmental authorities acting with the responsibility for public health. What I observed during that time was that people could find any and all manner of authorities insofar as they agreed with what they themselves wanted. Masks? Well, I agree with somebody who advocates for masks. No masks? Well, I agree with them and that authority. And the bottom line was, well, if I don't agree with the way that it is, the way that I'm being told, if it's not the way that I want it, well, then I reject that authority. Well, when this is the attitude, we find ourselves really in the wild, wild west, folks. It's a free-for-all. And chaos ensues when we reject any rule and authority because, remember, when we reject it, we reject the God who instituted it. And I know that's a sore subject, even amongst us here. Let it go, folks, right? I've had COVID. I'm not masked right now. I understand that, sadly, even in light of what has happened, we can observe that the struggle came home to roost in the church as well. Many voices within the church, including brother pastors of mine, advocated for rejection of our governmental authorities during that time. We're keeping churches open, they said. They feared that the pandemic was nothing more than a ploy on the part of secular government to take over and shut down religious institutions. These pastor friends of mine cited the authority of Scripture, turning specifically to Acts chapter 5, verse 29, where Peter himself says we must obey God rather than men. And so they did all manner of things, keeping churches open, continuing to do common cup communion in spite of the warnings that came from sharing germs that could potentially come from these places. And while I can understand the truth of what Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 5, I would also offer that I believe that the governmental agencies and authorities were working and in fact are still working with the greater good of society when it comes to the matter of public health. And I still would prefer to err on the side of caution perf perf personally. But when we talk about Peter's speech from Acts chapter 5, you can't read that speech outside of the context into which he spoke. The context was that in that case, the high priest ordered Peter and the apostles not to preach in the name of Jesus, which then led to Peter's admission, we must obey God rather than men. At no time, I'd like to point out during the pandemic or since, has the government told us as the church to stop preaching Jesus. They only asked that we be responsible as places where people gather together en masse to refrain for a time in meeting so that we wouldn't give the virus a chance to spread amongst our churchgoers. In fact, I found it personally as a time in which we had to act creatively as church so to continue proclaiming God's word. And we even did things that I felt like as church we should have done like adding new channels and means by which people could take part in the gospel. Things like Facebook and YouTube, and we even added a radio program here at Redeemer Lutheran Church. 
It was a time in which our God used the difficulty of our situation to multiply the church's avenues out into the public. It was a time when our God shared his authority of his word in many and various ways. But admittedly, not everyone saw it like that. I have to confess, I I had a hard time personally during the pandemic. Not because I had COVID during that time. I struggled to try and convey, however, what I found the plain sense of the text to be from Romans 13. That is, it was a sensible people that could perceive clearly what the text was saying. That our God is the ultimate authority. And that our God authorizes his agents people working through their given vocations to speak plainly and clearly. What I saw was that health officials officiated. Governors governed in times of difficulty. Presidents presided and pastors proclaimed. What happened is sometimes people rejected the authority that came from God. Sometimes people shot the messengers proverbially speaking. St. Paul also writes elsewhere in 2 Timothy chapter 4, a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. That is, authority figures that they resonate with. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now admittedly, also within context, As St. Paul writes these words to Timothy, he's writing about people rejecting the word of God, which has root in today's text from Romans 13, because that also is a word from God. I fear sometimes that these times Paul speaks of in 2 Timothy are upon us. But if I, as your pastor, am given to preach, to proclaim, then I will do as St. Paul encouraged a young pastor named Timothy in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, he said, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, because that's what I've been authorized to do, fulfill your ministry. So I will continue to speak as God's messenger. I'll continue to share the plain sense of the reading after studying it and understanding it. I'll continue to proclaim faithfully amongst you these readings according to their original intent, and I'll encourage you to do likewise, to pay attention to God's clear word, even as it's spoken in Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey your leaders, I would add those who are in authority, and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And in the meantime, I'll pray and hope that you don't feel compelled to shoot this messenger. Certainly, I don't want to make this just about me, because I believe it goes beyond me. That's how authority works. I'm not looking at this from the standpoint of simply my power over people to speak a word into God's people's ears. I see it as a part of authority. And as authority, I told you authority is the realm of God and God's people, which this authority has also been given to you as his church. I believe that this truth is for any God-fearing person in a position of any kind of authority who has been given the duty and called into the life of loving and serving their neighbors. And I also believe, for my part, that I think it's possible that's a reason people fail to enter into positions of authority or that they avoid them. Because they fear that perhaps as God's messenger, they too might get shot. But let me embolden and encourage you as God's people. He has indeed authorized you through the waters of holy baptism. He's called you to be his children and his messengers amongst people here on earth. And I don't think that I'm the first that needs to be reassured on this point. I think you do, too. That's why I think this word has been encouraged from a very early time. Listen again, for instance, to the word of our Lord in the Old Testament lesson as he spoke through the prophet Ezekiel. So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. 
Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person will die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity. But you will have delivered your soul. I believe this is a word for all of us as church, to share with those whom we love and care deeply about as messengers of God's word to the world that we see that our God authorizes us to speak in a very unique way to people that we know and that we love. We can speak this word into their lives, warning them from their ways and helping them to turn back to the way of our Lord because that's what we've been authorized to do. Remember the mandate from Matthew 28, go therefore, make disciples of all nations. How do you do it? You baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you teach God's people all that he has commanded. That command is for all of us to teach, even through our actions. And our actions speak what we believe regarding the word. And so we also have to live according to the example of the word. That is the word who has made flesh, Jesus Christ. We have his example to follow. You see, because even in his darkest hour when he was on trial before Pilate and the crowds, Jesus didn't reject the governmental authority of Pilate. Instead, he affirmed and submitted to it. In John chapter 19, verse 10, Pilate says to Jesus, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus, correctly and in line with St. Paul's words in Romans 13, speaks to Pilate in John 19, 11. He says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. And Jesus submitted to the authority of Pilate, ultimately being put to death, as you well know. Why did this have to happen? Because God placed all the sin, all the curses, all the rejection of his messengers down through time, literally all things that are in opposition to our God as the ultimate authority, God put them on his son, Jesus. And Jesus was killed. Not shot as the messenger, but crucified. Indeed, God allowed Jesus to die for these sins. Thanks be to God. Because had Jesus, as God's messenger, not died for them, every one of you and me included would still have to. But our God allowed his messenger, Jesus, to die for our sins. And not just to die, but to rise again from the dead. And we're authorized to share this message with others, that sin has been paid for and accounted for by Christ. And each and every one of you is authorized to share this message with others. But God's messenger Jesus could not be held by the bonds of death. Instead, he rose victorious, and we live in his kingdom, enjoying the fruits of his kingdom. And therefore, even if a governmental authority in our day and age acts in opposition to us, we know that we are citizens of a different kingdom. And we're under the ultimate authority, which is our God. And believe it or not, by believing this, you have the opportunity and blessed obligation to live according to it, which makes you, by extension, one of God's authorized messengers as well. Living by obeying and adhering to the authorities that God has put in place. Agreeing to God's directives as his people, you are his messengers, living, loving, and obeying, and sharing the example of what it looks like to live within his kingdom, authorized as his disciples to go and make other disciples. The last thing that I would want is to see any of you as his messengers, getting shot, or me. So go. Go confident in his word, emboldened by his grace, and empowered by his authority, encouraged by his messenger as his messengers. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, may guard your hearts and your minds and keep you in and under the authority of God's word until life everlasting. Amen. Please stand as we join together for the prayers of the church. Knowing that our Lord has promised to be in our midst wherever two or three are gathered in his name, let us bring our prayers and supplications before him. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For pastors, that as God's watchmen, they would be faithful in calling sinners to repentance and joyfully announcing the Lord's forgiveness to those who heed their warning, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful, that each of us would serve as our brother's keeper, authorized both in our earthly families and among our brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we would owe no one anything except to love one another, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our leaders, those authorized to bear the sword, that they would bear it righteously. And for all who protect us, especially our armed forces, first responders, police, and firefighters, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are ill, grieving, and lonely, especially those listed in our bulletin today and those we name before you in our hearts and minds, that they would remember that the Good Shepherd loves them and seeks and saves those who are lost. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all God's little ones, that they would not perish, but they would be called back to him when tempted to stray, and that they would be delivered from temptation. Bless them as they begin their endeavors in learning God's word in Odyssey Sunday School and adult Bible classes, and keep them in the faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all those for whom we pray this day, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated now as we enjoy an anthem sung by our choir.
We stand as we continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn number 698. But once again, welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. Uh, maybe didn't get to give you a proper welcome at the beginning because we were um, making preparations for, uh, for Sunday school and the announcements with that. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for the second sermon this morning. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention to see if I should have to do a second sermon today. Uh, listen, a couple of quick announcements, and then I want to turn it over quickly to Dave here to give our report. Um, if you'll note in the bulletin today, uh, there was um, an oversight um, that happened on the part of us in the office. Um, I had an announcement in the bulletin about the beginning of uh, confirmation classes for our 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students um, with a beginning orientation meeting that was supposed to happen last week, but it was inadvertently omitted for a couple of weeks in my um, while I was gone, it went before that. It, it did run in the bulletin before that, but it was omitted in the weeks while I was gone. So we elected this past week to put off for a week. But this week on Wednesday evening, 6 p.m., I need to have my fifth, or excuse me, my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students and their parents here uh, in room B, where we will combine both our orientation meeting and the distribution of materials for the kids, along with um, working through our first lesson together. So. I want to make sure that there's a verbal announcement on that. It is also printed in the bulletin. Also, um, another quick uh, uh, bulletin announcement that I want to point out to you um, that you see, there's both a written piece and then this uh, flyer that was included. Um, at the conclusion, or during the course of uh, the previous adult Bible class that I was teaching on death and dying, 
Um, one of the things we mentioned was um, the possibility of green burial as an alternative to uh, cremation or even um, inhumation bodily burial. Um, green burial is still inhumation, I should say, but um, we're fortunate to have in town here that uh, Kirby and Family uh, Funeral Homes is offering this as an option. And what you see here is they're offering a lunch and learn um, opportunity where there's a, a free lunch provided on September 20th. Um, this event will be held out at their cemetery at Kirby's Tucker Memorial Cemetery um, at 1130 where they'll talk about um, this process and what makes it different from others. And um, I was actually told about this by Tom, one of the funeral directors over there a while back, and I told him when this event was, was going to go on to please get me information. So I'm passing it along to you, and uh, I'll encourage you. I'm going to probably do my best to, to be in attendance there so I can uh, try and learn about this um, as a process as well, but wanted to point it out to you all as well. I think the rest of the uh, announcements, I'll commend your reading. Um, if I neglected to say it, I want to make sure to, to issue a warm welcome to all of you who are guests and visitors. Um, I didn't tell you as the choir was preparing to sing um, to please fill out the fellowship cards and put them in the baskets, but hopefully um, people did do that. If you're a guest and visitor and you didn't do it, please try and catch me in the door on the way out. I think that's all I've got, so come on up, Dave, and I'm going to turn things over to you, and I'll have you go over to the lectern because there's a mic that's on over there. Um, as Dave's coming up, uh, I'll just remind you, sort of in the strain of this morning's um, text and sermon, um, Dave is not only the president of our congregation, but was elected by our circuit forum of churches, which includes 14 churches in the Jonesboro circuit. Um, Dave was our elected official to attend on behalf of our churches, the national convention as a voting delegate. Um, Dave uh, performed his duties well. Um, I know he was studying the materials prior to going to synodical convention. And lest you think this is not an important thing, um, matters of doctrine are bandied about at this. And so we watch carefully what happens at our national convention to make sure that our church body as a whole is adhering to the truth of God's word. And so um, Dave has been waiting patiently for, I think, the final um, announcement to come out. And I think he's going to share with you from that because it's now come out, so I'm turning it over to him. Good morning. First of all, let me just say that I am humbled and privileged to have been the person to represent our circuit at this wonderful convention. It was an experience of a lifetime for me, and I know for a lot of others, because when they checked it out, nearly half of the voting members at the convention were first timers. So the first day on Saturday, we met at noon and it was more an orientation day than anything. This is how you approach the mic to talk to a issue. This is how you vote on an issue. This is how you uh, tell people who you are and where you're from. You had to do that every time you went to the mic and whatever. And uh, I would say this, at the end of the day, became the highlight of the convention for me. We had a joint communion service for the, about 1,500 people that were there. And the singing was out of this world. You just couldn't believe how good our hymns sound when you have that many good voices. And there were, of course, a lot of singing pastors there. and. A lot of singing lay people who were very good. It was really an experience, and I got to experience that with my wife, Marcia, who was there as well. So it was a, it was a privilege, and it was an honor to, to do it. We'll start with last May. This book came in the mail to me, 400-some pages of overtures. They start with all of the 35 district conventions where they decide things they want to present to the National Convention the next time it meets. So we had a two-hour meeting in Russellville, of all places. If you've been there, you know you can't get there from here. And Pastor Pavlo went through these things and talked about the things that he thought might be uh, of issue or things that he wanted to see happen. He says, I can't tell you how to vote. I'm just telling you my opinion and the opinion of the district office. So then. The next thing that happens is Pastor Pavlo, along with all of the other floor managers of the various issue areas, 
spent a couple of very, very difficult days in St. Louis boiling that down from 400 pages to 200 pages. A lot of what was presented was duplications, so they have to combine them. They have to come up with, and they also have to eliminate some that may be just kind of frivolous or some that are already being taken care of by other organizations within Synod. So this is what we had for the proposed resolutions. So then we get to the convention, and the first thing they hand out to us is an opening devotion service. And of course, I'm gonna cherish this because it was really fantastic. The pastor who actually served communion to Marcia and I is Pastor Peter Lang, who is the first vice president of the Synod and is a, a native Kansan, which makes me feel good. <laughs> Pastor Lang was the district president in Kansas and then became the first vice president by vote, and he was reelected as first vice president. So every day we had a worship service several times. In fact, the way I counted them in the most recent reporter result was 13 worship services during the five days that we met. And they were all lined out in here. Everybody participated in the mornings in the order of matins with a senior pastor, probably a district president, preaching the sermon or someone from the staff at uh, St. Louis. The very first sermon we had that first night was preached by Pastor Harrison, who is the president of the Synod. The theme of the thing was, we preach Christ crucified so that people don't forget what this is all about. And it was brought up in every sermon that was there, was woven into the way that uh, it was talked about. The other thing that we have to do besides addressing all of the resolutions and deciding whether they were good, bad, or what we should do with them, we also had to vote for many, many, many offices. The three or four, five, five, maybe it's six vice presidents, I'm not sure, all had to be elected and they were all re-elected, same people. So it says that people are satisfied with our leadership. Then we voted on things like who's gonna be on the commission for church and whatever relations and so on and so on. One of the things I wanna make sure that people understand is that every one of these votes beyond the vice presidents allowed for lay people to be elected to commissions, to boards of regents. This church is not completely oriented toward the, lay, uh, the uh, ordained people. Half of the voting members were lay people, half of them were preachers. So we had a good say in what we wanted to do. I would also admit, I uh, would, would tell you that there were 11 lay people and 11 lay, uh, ministers in our, circ or in our district that went, so there were 22 of us that voted in our district. Now, our district goes all the way from way back in Tennessee to way over to the end of Arkansas. So in order to cover that, Pastor Pavla had to have five or six different sessions like we had in Russellville to get with each one of those. So it was not an easy part for him to get everything lined up. He, by the way, was one of the managers of one of the groups that made presentations. I will now move on to try and get this uh, wrapped up before we go to Bible study. Uh, 1,023 voting delegates, 160 advisory delegates. Those are people who are selected to attend but cannot vote. 162 advisory representatives, which mostly would be retired people in uh, ordained positions or commissioned positions. 
<clears throat> we passed 83 resolutions during the time we were there. I'll talk about a few of those that were significant in my point of view. We had 14 opportunities for worship. Four times we had a pastor spend at least 30 minutes talking about a subject. They called it an essay. And then we had four sessions like that on the new catechism that's coming out. People talking about, these were all senior pastors talking about what's in the new catechism. Okay, the <clears throat> resolutions that I think were significant had to do with affirming in-person and closed communion. There's been some issues within the Synod of people trying to do communion by internet, of all things. No, we can't do that. <laughs> Affirm residential seminary education. In other words, if you want to be a pastor, you should go to seminary. It's not the only way to become a pastor in the church, but is recommended. We also revised the bylaws that relate to how the synod interacts with the university system in our church. We have like five or six universities and they are, according to the bylaws, subject to doing things the way the church wants them done. And it was one of the contentious issues and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Okay, um, let me move on here. Another thing that was, to me, was very nice. Uh, it was a positive thing overall. We recognized altar and pulpit fellowship with five church bodies around the world. The Evangelical Lutheran Church of South Sudan and Sudan. The Evangelical Lutheran Mission Diocese of Finland. The Lutheran Church of Uganda. The Evangelical Lutheran Church of Ukraine and the Ceylon Evangelical Lutheran Church in Sri Lanka. A significant one of those was Finland. Pastor Pavla is Finnish. He's personally well acquainted with the Bishop of the Finland Church. And so they had several things where they got together and talked to us, so that was really neat. Uh, <clears throat> The one issue that was really contentious had to do with Concordia University, Texas. You may have heard some things, some rumors, you may have written about, read about it. Apparently, they're going off the track a little bit on how they interpret things that should be taught at the university. The primary thing is that they're talking about teaching about LGBTQ issues. Synod says, no, you can't do that in a synod controlled university, they have actually opted to leave the Synod. We had a resolution to ask for reconciliation. It said they should submit to the governance of the Synod, this is the Board of Regents, should submit to the governance of the Synod, repent, seek reconciliation and rest restoration by rescinding their actions. Unfortunately, while we elected four members of their Board of Regents there, which is typical of every one of the universities, it happens every Synod convention, they refused to seat those people right off the bat. The result is the Synod owns the university campus. They can't just take it and walk away. Our chief legal officer at Synod spoke and he said if they decide to do that and continue, there was gonna have to be some action taken. And recently, in about two or three weeks ago, the Synod filed suit in court. The estimated value of that campus in Austin, Texas is about $300 million. <clears throat> so if they wanna continue on their wayward approach, they're gonna to have to come up with $300 million or come back to Senate. It's yet to be decided. I have to say this too, just to make you feel a little better about the whole situation. 
the only people speaking to that resolution as a positive thing were people from Texas. And it didn't make any sense to me, knowing the Texans are very conservative. Why would they would do that? But they did. And the result was an overwhelming vote for the resolution. We pray that they will come to their senses and return. Unfortunately, over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, we've lost three Concordia universities because of not being able to attract enough students. And we're now down, like I said, to five or six, where people go to train basic training in how to you know, either become a commissioned person, which means a teacher or a, a DMP or whatever, or they go to get ready to go to seminary. So we need those places. We need them badly. There was also a lot of issue about the lack of enough pastors to fill the pulpits in our church. About 530 vacancies at this point in time. Sounds like a lot. But then it was noted that typically, just because of movement around, there's about 400 vacancies at any one time. So it's bad, but it's not terrible. There is an initiative out there that's trying to address this issue by getting to younger people in the Senate that are in Sunday school and whatever to encourage them to become pastors for our Senate. We're also short on teachers, too, by a long shot. So a positive about the education side, though, one of the things that did recently was we went to Kansas, Marsh and I did, and <clears throat> had the opportunity to visit my old church in Greenleaf, Kansas, which is a rural congregation. I also had the opportunity to talk with my cousins there who go to another church in the area at Lynn, Kansas, which has a parochial school. Their parochial school is bursting at the seams. Because of COVID, people are bringing their kids to parochial schools. They've had to build on once. They're thinking about building on again. And I kind of get the rumor that this is happening a lot, that people are moving their kids from the social schools, so we call them, to the parochial schools. So anyway, that's a positive in what's going on. I'm available. By the way, one other thing i got to bring up. I got a publication while I was there. There's a publication produced by a historical group that's a, a Senate authorized group. Last year was the 175th anniversary of our Senate. It was formed in 1847 in Chicago, Illinois. And this publication actually came out last year to talk about how they formed the Senate. It's amazing. It's just, it's almost a parallel to what happened with forming the United States. There was a lot of dissension. There was a lot of discussion. But overall, God prevailed, and we have today a very, very good synod. I am so impressed with our leadership throughout, from Pastor Harrison through all of the vice presidents. They're solid people, and we're on the right track. Thank you for letting me go and representing you. Dave, Dave, thank you for your service as well. We sure appreciate that um, we've got people that are willing to step up and take in uh, these roles, um, even as I lamented it during the sermon today a little bit. But what you heard a little bit in his report is just um, sort of the attitude towards some of the authority um, issues that God has placed before us. Um, with regard to Concordia, Texas, um, what happened there was the Board of Regents um, wrote basically a declaration of independence and said we no longer want to be under synodical control, but we want to be under our own control. So what you see is a rejection of the authority and the system that has been put in place and has been operational for years. So, um, you know, we see this as still a problem and people, as I said from that quotation from the, from the commentary, people seeking to ignore the plain sense of a text. And um, so we pray that, that God would um, help them to reconcile. That was part of our gospel lesson today. And I'm not going to preach another sermon. I'm going to greet you in the back. And I pray that you have a blessed day and week in the name of the Lord.